control of American and New England studies. His work working career began at SUNY New Paltz and later as a restoration craftsman at Historic Huguenot Street in New Paltz, New York. He is involved in preserving historic traditions in woodworking, timber framing, blacksmithing, and masonry skills. He received the New Netherlands Institute's prestigious Alice Kenny Award in 2018. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Nina's work. and the Leiser Institute, as well as the Hudson Area Library, and all of you for coming out this evening. I will try and keep this interesting and moving along. Uh, uh, but please save questions for the end. There will be plenty of time for those. So this is an Anglo-Dutch house, sometimes referred to as an eyebrow colonial, or a federal story and a half. What this is, what this represents architecturally, is the synthesis of two timber framed traditions which really conjoined here in the Hudson Valley in the years post the settlement of Hudson, but in other contact areas between the area of New Netherlands and New England, these houses also appear. But really, Columbia County is the site of the first flourishing of this architectural style, which would go from here, as far east as Maine, and as far west, I discovered them in Wisconsin. So to understand the settlement, and to understand why these buildings evolved, we have to understand who the people were. So 1620s, the Hudson Valley was settled by the West India Company, the Dutch West India Company, um, as a trading area. Unlike New England, which was uh, designed as a colonial venture, the Dutch looked at New Netherland as a place to make money. Now this is the height of the Dutch Republic, and in their maps you can see, New Netherland is all about three rivers, the Delaware River, the Hudson River, and the Connecticut River, and those are the boundaries of New Netherland. And on their maps are listed the Native American tribes, their villages, and usually in the ephemera are the animals that they're trading, primarily beaver pelts. So, many of the people who were here are not actually Dutch. They're not from the Netherlands. Uh, remember, this is the, the height of the Golden Age of the Dutch Republic. Uh, it's hard to convince a wealthy burger or a, a freeman to come here and try and eke out a living on a farmstead where there may be potentially unfriendly natives. So much of New Netherland is settled by religious refugees, Huguenots, Walloons, uh, Palatine Germans, and that settlement pattern continues. Now, of course, there are the Dutch families who come, um, but mu many of the early colonists were, in fact, people like Walloons who bring their own architectural styles. Sort of this is how you get a sort of sense for really this is the, the core of it in the 1600s. You've got the momentary blip that is New Sweden. People don't often know that there was a New Sweden momentarily. Uh, was brought on by a disgruntled Dutch West India Company employee. He knew there was only a, a fort with four people down at the entrance to the Delaware River and convinced the, the, the royalty of Sweden to, to start a colony. Uh, so it lasted until Peter Stuyvesant found out about it and went down and shut down the affair. But to this day, uh, Christiana in Delaware, is, that's the, that's named after, that was named after in the 1640s. These buildings should look familiar. Mm -hmm. I'm around Hudson. Uh, that's the, the Brick Van Hoosen house over on Spookrack, and that's the house in the Dutch Village Trailer Park. These may be the most southern brick houses, brick Dutch urban houses, still extant in Columbia County, actually in New York State. This style was the predominant style 
in the Netherlands. If you went down the streets of New Amsterdam, these are the houses you'd see. Or uh, Albany, which would later be called, which was before that called Better Lake. Uh, this is the Peter Winnie House across the river. Mm. Um, this is a 1728 house that when it was discovered 15 years ago by Brian Parker didn't look like this at all. Uh, was, everything was peeled off. If you're up in Albany, 48 Hudson Avenue may in fact been built by the same builder. Uh, if you walk by it, it looks nothing like this. It has a 1930s storefront. Although there's a lovely Dutch, there's a lovely scrim hanging on the front of the building that shows how it would have looked originally when it was built. Mm. Um, it's in the process of being restored. These are the buildings that really are the predominant buildings in the Netherlands. And it has a very distinct architect, tech, timber frame style, architectural style. Uh, you've got these large rubies, Kusenbal, these little corbeals, uh, fairly thin wall posts. And if we, if we go back here, this is the line where the first floor ends. And you've got this knee wall here. The Dutch word for it is for deeping. Um, that is an instant visual recognition from an exterior of a building that a building has, if it's timber frame, has Netherlandish roots. The English and the French do not build, do not typically frame knee walls. Uh, I'll get into that. I'll get into what the English do in a minute. So this is, there it is. That's the typical Dutch frame. You have these, what we now call vents, derived from the Dutch word gebint, meaning assembly. Typically in the new world, these are four feet on center. It's a lot of wood for a small building. Um, but the Dutch are the first people here. The forests are immense. Um, I've worked on Dutch barns here in the Hudson Valley where some of the large timbers are you know, 18 by 36 by 35 foot long. Um, I'm fairly certain the Dutch carpenters just took one look at the trees and lost their minds. Um, yeah, I, in the Netherlands, you never find timbers that large, except maybe in large state, um, state buildings. Uh, City halls, that sort of thing, churches. Uh, remember, because the Netherlands, not actually known for its forests. <laughs> uh, the Dutch have to say that uh, God made the world of Dutch and Holland. Um, most of the Netherlands is, in fact, underwater. Uh, so in this period, they're importing to the Netherlands all their timber through the Hanseatic League from Scandinavia. So you've got these sort of closely spaced beds this knee wall, it gives you two stories of a fairly decent living space. Uh, and then you get a lot of them have these side aisles. A um, little further south, into Ulster County, you get the, the framing's the same, the, the two symbolics are there, they're four feet on center, but now they're doing it all in stonework, uh, which is unusual, and this loops back around to the, the commentary about how not everyone here was from the Netherlands, the Dutch don't build in stone, except for churches and city halls. Uh, stone houses are a Flemish thing and a Walloon thing. It's, uh, Belgium, what's now modern Belgium. Uh, so French-speaking Belgians, Dutch-speaking Belgians, they're the ones who are building in stone. Um, and they're the ones who are, in fact, building in stone here. Uh, so you've got what is, in essence, Dutch form being built by uh, Belgian stoneworkers in the Hudson Valley. Now, this is just a point of information. Uh, these big anchor beams, if you're in a Dutch barn, these big anchor beams with these big through tenons, a lot of people will refer to every cross timber in a Dutch frame as an anchor beam. The Dutch are fairly specific. Unless it's got that big through tenon that's wedged, it's not an anchor beam. Uh, this is my own personal crusade, it has no bearing. Uh, so, yeah, now, New England houses. Um, first thing you can see is the windows run right up to the plate line. 
because those windows are in fact framed into the plate line. It's a full second story. This is your typical New England, uh, it's actually got a salt box on it, but originally it's a single pile, so it's one room deep. It's three bays, so in timber framing, you know, you've got one, two, three bays. This tower actually has an addition, this is a better one, so there's one bay, center bay. And that center bay was focused on that chimney, generally referred to as the chimney bay. Um, this is the style that comes over from England. Well, it modifies. Uh, earlier houses were a lot like that. Uh, if you've been to New England, uh, some of the places you're used to seeing them, sometimes they have overhangs on the front with pendants. Uh, that's a very traditional post-medieval English house. Um, but this is, this is fairly, this is fairly common. New England house, uh, originally probably single pile, and then they decide to add the aisle on the back, the salt box. Uh, sometimes referred to as the mullet of American architecture. Series in the front, party in the rear. Um, so uh, these are later, these are later windows. These are 18th century English sash. Initially it would have been casements. So, um, and anyone who's been in one of these houses know they're sort of truncated. You walk in, there's a staircase right in front of you. That staircase gets you upstairs. You can access the bedrooms on either side because that entire central bay is taken up by a massive chimney. If they're, if they're ambitious when they build that chimney, they put three fireplaces on each floor um, because they know eventually they're going to build a salt box on. If you're ever out at Strawberry Bank, one of the houses, they had part of the wall peeled away, and there was a, a kitchen fireplace put on the back of the chimney stack, and they never extended the house out. So it was put there when the house was built in 1790, and they never had the money to, to put the salt box on. So to this day, it's a completely unused um, fire box. This is the more common small style. It looks really it looks really strange in this picture because it's only half a cake. Um, it's very common out east Long Island, uh, the eastern Cape Cod. Uh, the Eastern Shore, where they survive. But these are referred to as Cape Cod houses. Although a typical Cape Cod house, I think, yep, there it is. So you've got three bays. There's your chimney bay, hall, and parlor. Um, typically, the spacing on these is, is 12 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Um, sometimes 12, 12, 12. Geometry is your friend, so a lot of these things had to break down in three, four, five. Um, so, because these were all built prior to really the, the, the regulation of the framing square. The framing square has been around for, for thousands of years, but really it's not until 1790, 1800, um, where they start really regulating them and an inch becomes what we think of as an inch. Um, until that point, every culture had its own measurement system. The English inch was different from the Dutch inch, just like the English acre and the Dutch acre were different. Um, it's sort of fascinating. You can look at churches and figure out um, the masters who built them had their own rules that they measured everything by. And you can figure out how long the master's rule was based on the geometry used in the building. So you can see in this Cape House, the second floor is not very usable. I mean, there, there's there's space for a room there, um, but you're probably going to put your your children up here, um, maybe servants, maybe slaves. Um, really, that that roof line just kind of gets in the way of usable space. Anyone who spent any time in, in this, you know. And the Cape House knows that the upstairs is kind of awkward. So this is the architectural style that comes out of New England. Um, yeah. So 1783, uh, 20, the 20 proprietors sent somebody up over $100,000 to start buying the land. Um, 
So there's there's a map taken four years before. And really, Columbia County is divided between Rensselaer Bike in the north and Livingston Manor in the south. Uh, anyone who knows the history of the area, the Livingstons were not the best landlords. Um, a lot of the tenant the rent wars happened down in Livingston Manor because perhaps they weren't the best landlords. Um, whereas Rensselaer Bike's a little bit more loosey goosey. <coughs> Um, there have been English coming over the border from Massachusetts for about 30 years, secretly sort of setting up, uh, setting up settlements here on the eastern side. So much so that sort of by the middle of the 18th century, they, they, they create a whole new sort of township. Um, but this area is still predominantly Dutch. Martin Van Buren. His first language was Dutch. He didn't learn English until he was 16. His wife, who was born in 1783, she didn't learn English until 1810 or 1800, somewhere around. She was 18, so it's 1801. 1801. Um, this area is predominantly Dutch. During the Revolutionary War, the English are talking about the fact that they need Dutch interpreters to deal with the citizenry up here. All of the all the negotiations with any Native American tribe in this area was done in Dutch. Um, Americans dealing with the the Miyakataka people, the Mohawk, used to talk about the fact they had to find a, Mohawk, uh, a Dutch translator who could take English to Dutch and then Dutch to the, to the Mohawk and the Mohawks crossing themselves so the four languages, three languages, three languages. So there's this massive influx once Hudson gets formed. If really, if you look at the year between 1790 and 1800, that decade, that's nearly 10,000 people moving into Columbia County. That's a massive number of people moving in. Now, they're not all heads of household. They don't all require houses. But if you break it down into heads of households, it's something on the order of 3,000 people. So taking that, and if you aggregate that over a 10-year span, assuming that a head of a household will pay for a house, that means in the decade between 1790 and 1800, 300 houses a year were being built in Columbia County. Now, we can assume that some of those people are staying in inns, they're staying in tenant farmhouses that don't survive. But still, you're looking at probably somewhere on the order of 200 buildings a year being built. So, there's a challenge. The Dutch carpenters who live here are being tasked to build something they don't know how to build, which is a New England style house, a salt box. Mm -hmm. Now, it sort of looks like a Dutch house with a side aisle, but there are not enough carpenters there's really not enough wood to do it English style or Dutch style. So what do you do? Well, you start to do things like this. From the outside, it's a soapbox <laughs> built into the hillside. Uh, actually, I, let's just plan. This is my house. Uh, this is what led me down the merry road to this, to, the, to what would turn into my master's deep this and, uh, and then this talk. So, you can see up here, there's that knee wall. Um, it, it makes for fairly commodious living upstairs. Um, full story here, full story here, but this is two-thirds stone foundation. So this is the framing of it. So instead of the seven bents, six bents you would need if it were a Dutch house, or the four bents, for an English house, this has three. There's one vent, there's two vents, there's three vents. So unlike English framing, where you've got sort of big, uh, they call summer beams running between the vents that then carry the flooring, this has rather large, these are six by six hewn timbers running from E to E. This is a combination of the two styles. Um, they're a little closer, spaced, about three feet apart instead of four feet apart. 
Um, this requires significantly less joinery. If you're paying a carpenter by the hour, <coughs> that carpenter has apprentices, but mind you, 200 houses a year are being built. There aren't that many carpenters here. Even the carpenters are coming in from New England. We, the census shows we just don't have that many carpenters here. What's the solution? Less joiner. Those timbers literally just sit on that timber. It, full, it, it creates the function of, of a full <coughs> knee wall, a full second, you know, a, a half story, with a third of the joinery. Um, based on things I've seen in the period, a good carpentry crew could probably cut the frame for this and erect it in a month. And when you think that starting from tree, taking all the axe, that's actually really fast. Um, so this becomes sort of a cheap and fast house, but as you'll see, it allows for a certain stylistic variation. So there's the, there they are, those, those closely spaced floor joists. This one actually carries a wall above it. Um, it's 14 inches across and reach. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then sometimes you've got these weird little uh, saw members that kind of get stuck in there. So. And I didn't know this when I first wrote this my thesis or I first gave this talk, but I've since had my house dendro, dendro dated, and I would have, if you would put a gun in my head, I would have told you my house was probably 1790, 1800. In fact, this house was built in 1843 in the spring. Um, the fact that it's hewn timbers and built in this style in 1843, we stopped really using hewn timbers in Columbia County by 1835. So even in 1843, this house is a throwback house. I suspect there was a house on the property earlier and burned, but um, still trying to dig through deeds. Uh, up on the up on the third floor, there's that there's the plate, the knee wall plate. Um, you can see the peggings are visible. It's a very lightly framed thing. Now, if you're out on Route 23, there's this sort of pink-looking house right before you get to the intersection of 23 and 9H. Um, mm -hmm. Off to the side, it's got a gable end to the streets. It's abandoned. Um, you'd never know this was in it because it's got this sort of Victorian front. But a little friendly breaking entering and uh, <laughs> This is actually an Anglo-Dutch house that's had a front addition added onto it. And a lot of these houses end up this way. They end up being consumed by later houses, much like Dutch houses do. Um, but got up into the, into the second story and that, that, that told me everything I needed to know. That is, a, that is absolutely an Anglo-Dutch house. Three vents, tiny little footprint, uh, that chimney did not actually go all the way to the, floor, to the first floor. It sits on a stool on the, up, in the, up in the attic. How old? I'm guessing probably first quarter of the 19th century. So, there's the Dutch house. Bents, four feet on center. So seven bents. Uh, 28 foot long building. You've got a, let's call this a 34 foot long building. It's four beds, uh, but not very usable space. And then you combine the two. And you've got a building that has sort of the same footprints as this. Uh, this, this house is actually 28 by 28 nearly square, 28 by 29. Um, half the wood, a third of the joinery. Mm -hmm. This house can get cranked out, which is the key. This is the, this is the selling point of the Anglo-Dutch house. This is why they take off. 
these, the synthesis of these two styles. And they allow for massive variation stylistically. And if you drive around Columbia County, you'll see these all over the place. This is over, uh, just freshly got repainted. Uh, if you're heading north on County 9 out of Ghent with the Arnold's Mills there, there are a cluster of these right there. Um, this is further up, uh, east, of, east of there. Um, looks fairly tight, uh, but there's that knee wall. You look inside, there's the exposed frame. Now, if you go to Southern Columbia County, there are less of these. Once you get into Livingston Manor, the number of these dry up. So, uh, sort of supports the idea that these are being built by Dutch carpenters, and people are being taught by Dutch carpenters here in what is, what is still runs near bike. Um, but, you know, there it is, there's that knee wall. It's really obvious when there is no windows. Um, that also later on becomes a really good place for Greek revival ornamentation. Because uh, wouldn't that look great with a freeze board? <laughs> oh, like that. Um, I mean, if you look at that, it's, that's a Greek revival or a federal story and a half. But if you look at it closely, that's an Anglo Dutch house. It's just ornamented. And it's longer now, so this probably has four beds in it. So it's got that center entrance. Um, so instead of the three bends where they're sort of smaller, now it's, it's, I've been in a couple of these and they have four bends. They get really interesting sometimes with framing. You start getting weird additions of timbers that um, fell out of fashion 20 years earlier, but there it is, summer beams and whatnot. So really this house allows the owner to express their stylistic desire, their wealth, fairly easily. Uh, another Greek revival. This one's got bigger windows cut in, uh, allowing further light up into that area, into the second story. But it, it sort of lacks the big heavy pilasters, so it's sort of an intermediate Greek revival. Um, if you go up into, oh, where is this? East Town? North Town, there it is. Um, North Chapman has a ton of these. There's, that, there's this one, which actually has a broken back, what they call a broken back salt box, but I mean, that's a pure Anglo Dutch house. That one's sort of snuck in. Once you get used to looking for them, you see them. Uh, driving by that house, you'll notice the three bay gay lend house, which is. Uh, I hope nothing, the most common historic housing style built in the United States. It's the three-way day born house. But, probably, the first part of that house is this mm -hmm. a Dutch house, that then when they finally got money, or the family expanded, or they were keeping up with the Joneses, they had, they had the three-way day born house as an addition. And so driving along, you'll, you'll see that, if you pay attention, you'll see that. This one, uh, this is in North Chatham again, right next to the church. Uh, smaller, Gable Land House. But again, there it is. There's the Anglo Dutch house with the salt box. Um, sort of obscured by the porch. But once you start to look for them, you'll see them. And then we get to Valatia, which, which is kind of an interesting place in its own because it's a mill town. Um, and so they're building Anglo-Dutch houses that are two families. Uh, and if you drive through Valencia, about a third of the building stock is sort of near the downtown are buildings like this. And they're all late 18th century, early 19th century, <coughs> Anglo-Dutch framed mill houses, originally designed as multi-family residences. Um, I'm still trying to work my mind around these. This is, I haven't had enough time to really focus on these, so if anyone lives in one, or knows someone lives in one, let me know. Um, now, there's this sneaky one around the corner. 
not an Anglo Dutch house. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know why it's not an Anglo Dutch house? It, it's the windows. Full two story and the windows need the plate. That's an English house. Uh, probably originally it was a little bit wider. I suspect it originally had a fourth bay, and that was the central chimney bay. But that's that's English framed, and that's in prop in Hudson proper. If you go down, if you go actually go up Warren and go left, heading out um, on a fair view, you start to run into the Anglo Dutch houses because those are outside the, the, the control of the city of Hudson. So the English carpenters are working in Hudson. The, the cheaper local carpenters who haven't come in from New England, who are Dutch speakers, are working just outside of, of Hudson. Now there are Dutch carpenters working in, in Hudson, but it's sort of funny, you can see the line between the English carpenters and the Dutch carpenters, hold that thought. Um, so yeah. So that's, that's sort of where we are, and uh, that, that's, that's where we're finishing, is this frame. This frame becomes one of the most predominant architectural styles in North America. And I would venture that 98% of the people who live in one of these houses have no idea that it's a combination of English and Dutch timber framing that it started primarily in Columbia County and that it would become, I mean, that it was a prevalent form. I mean, you, you hear people talk about eyebrow colonials for a story and a half. No idea that it's a combination of Dutch timber framing and English timber framing, and it really represents the synthesis of a form that was never seen before in the old world. This is something completely new, something completely American. I mean, and, and it makes sense. You've got Dutch carpenters and English carpenters and New England settlers, and they want housing. And they need housing quick. And so it, it all kind of gets thrown together. And, and in, in the great in the American tradition, they sort of spit this out, uh, something new that had never been seen before that sort of spreads across the continent. So in your travels, you run across one of these, or give it a smile and a nod and know that you're looking at an Anglo-Dutch house. I mean, it, if it's got an E-wall, it could be a pure Dutch house. I have been known to, uh, to assume incorrectly. Uh, there's a house over on Leggett that was just on the market, and I thought it was an Anglo-Dutch house. I actually included it in a survey. And it was on the market, so I got him to see it. And in fact, no, it's an 18, it's a mid-18th century, or if not earlier, Dutch house that had an addition put onto it probably in 1800, but it's originally a Dutch house, it's originally a Dutch frame. Um, so, you know, but know that if it's got a knee wall, chances are pretty good it's got Dutch roots. So, questions? When you refer to New England, you mean New England of the United States or Great Britain? What do you mean by New England? New England. Uh, the colonies of New England. So Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, the New Hampshire grants, and then the northern part of Massachusetts, which would later become Maine. Um, uh, although if you're from New York, you probably claim them as the New York grants. And if you're like Jane and from Vermont, it's just Vermont. It's so, um, <laughs> By eliminating so much of the timbering, how did that affect the stability of the structure? So the joy of timber frame uh, is with the, with the appropriate bracing and the answer sort of the larger size timbers, you can get away with doing this. Um, if you look at, we'll have to scroll back here through, but uh, we'll get back to the slide with all the different framing. Um, now remember, these are traditions coming out of Europe. So Europe, by the 17th century, and the Netherlands has very little trees because, as I said before, the Netherlands is mostly a created country, at least the, the parts of Holland, you know, sort of North Holland, South Holland. Uh, England has been fairly denuded of its timbers. So you're using a lot of what we call scantling, which are smaller timbers. 
So if you look at if you look at this cape frame, you know, you sort of look at the floor joists, they're all fairly small, they're sort of four inch by four inch. Um, you know, the bigger timbers are used for, for major connecting pieces. But there's a lot of smaller timbers. The Dutch frame, you know, you've got the posts are fairly slender. You know, you've got seven large tie beams, but everything else in this frame is pretty light. Um, you don't have that restriction here in the United States. So, so they they beef up the timbers and um, reduce the joinery, beef up the timbers. And for as, as light as this frame looks, it's remarkably stable. Um, now the tightening up of the floor joists instead of four feet on center, or three or two and a half feet on center. Uh, I can tell you with 200 years, there's a little bit of balance, uh, but um, nothing horrendous. Um, and the joy of timber framing is it, the building will move with freeze thaw. The frame is designed to ride on the ground. Um, it's disturbing being on a timber frame with the sheeting off because you can shake the whole building and it's fine, but it, it does move. Um, Navarre and I just finished restoring, uh, the frame I just finished restoring again. It's unsheathed and so you can in fact shake the whole timber frame and get about an inch of movement. That's perfectly stable. It's been a good for another 200 years. So, it looks like there should be less stability, but there isn't. It's as rigid as this frame or this frame. Um, so, yeah. Other questions? Most of the houses we showed have a center, but the door is in the center. Mm -hmm. So in the drawing on the bottom, there's a post in the center. Yes. Would they uh, move it to the side and put another one to accommodate the So, so, on, so this is the drawing of my house, which has a side entrance. Um, if you look, so that's the side entrance. So the smaller ones, where it's three bays, where it's two bays, three beds, typically you end up with the door off center. Um, there it is off center again. It's, it's, it's making way for that post. When they start to really expand them and give it that classic five bay center entry look, yeah. Really, it's that's when they they add a fourth bay and a fourth bend into it, so it turns into instead of a two bay, it's a three bay. Um, so yeah, that's and that's how you end up with the center door. So I haven't found one where the where it looks like a, a, a center entry where the post has been moved, but I'm still a problem. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'm not sure I'm using the right terminology. Was there a difference in use of ridge poles between? In the framing? So, uh, ring beams. Yeah. Uh, if you head up to, if, if actually, in, at this time, yeah. there are no ridge beams. Not in this style of framing. The, the Dutch use what they call sporing capping, which means com it's common rafter. Um, <coughs> this, the cape houses use what they call um, Either principal rafter, principal purlin, or this is a this is a principal purlin system, common rafter, where you have large rafters where the vents tie in, um, and then sort of common rafters in between. Or in this, the, the purlins are carrying the rafters. Ridge beams are seen, um, but you typically see those further north. Uh, Vermont has a lovely tradition of five-sided uh, ridge beams, uh, which makes raising the roof really easy because you build the entire north side of the roof with the ridge beam in place, and then taking the two end rafters and standing the south side up, and then you just sort of slot the rest of the rafters in, and it's done. Uh, the fantastic way. These all had to be raised uh, by gin pole. Or, or uh, zeros. Um, and I haven't. I can tell you that having just raised a common rafter system on a barn, I ended up just calling in a uh, counter raccoon and a crane because there was no way I was going to do it with uh, with volunteers, 20 feet in the air, hoisting uh, hoisting 11 foot tall rafters. So, uh, did I answer your question? Well, I was just curious. You know, um, someone once told me that they weren't introduced to this area. 
until after the 1800s, and it's wondering how common they would be. Well, I mean, yeah, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not common, in, because the Dutch don't use them. Um, you do see them. Um, the one I, the one I showed there, that has a ridge board. Um, they come in 1810. Um, so that's. And that's typically, it's not a true ridge, ridge beam. You end up just getting through this sawn plank that they nail the rafters to. So. so. In the 18th century uh, Dutch houses, was there a favorite type of wood that they used for the framing? Mm. So, so uh, I love this chestnut. Um, everyone likes to think the house is made out of chestnut. Yeah. Everyone likes to think their barns are made out of chestnut. The number one species used in the Hudson Valley is a good old Pinus strobus. He's mm -hmm. kind of pine. Um, you will find you will find pitch pine. Pitch pine is pretty prevalent. Uh, places like Pine Plains, obviously, lots of pitch pine. Um, you do find uh, hemlock being used in the Catskills primarily because of the tanneries. <laughs> pulling the bark off and sort of tossing the wood away so it makes for good cheap timber. Um, bracing, sometimes hardwood. Um, you do find oak in frames. I have, I have seen Dutch barns made out of white oak. Um, I have worked on them. 300-year-old um, white oak that was probably 400 years old when it was cut. Uh, after 300 years, turns a lot into rock. Um, so, um, a lot of the time, if you're looking at a Dutch frame, your chances are you're looking at white pine. Um, you will find various other species. Uh, my house has white pine, pitch pine, there's oak, there's a little beech in there. Um, but yeah, it's primarily white pine. It's a great, white pine is a great wood. Don't want anyone to tell you that differently. It has this almost the same strength, the same modulus of elasticity as, as oak, white oak. Um, and it's easier to work. He's oh, thank you. Can you define for me um, knee wall? I'm not quite sure what that is. So, knee wall. Uh, so, this right here, you've got the plate above this girt. So, you've got this four foot rise here, um, creating, this, creating this half story. That is what we call, in architectural people call it a knee wall. It, it, it comes above the knee. It comes up to four feet. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, the Dutch word for this for deeping, uh, but for deeping also is any word for story above the first, because you know the Dutch, much like the English, have ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor. Um, so this would be the, the, the ask for deeping the first, the first story. Um, but yeah, so it's this, it's this frame wall above the joinery which which terminates the first floor. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the knee wall. Is that is that four foot rise that you can see from outside. Because you've got the window line and then you've got the four to six feet of wall above it. Well, thank you, because I think that that's describes my house. So. Well then you, you either live in a Dutch house or an Anglo Dutch house. <laughs> It's, it said it, it, it first appears on the map in 1765, so I assume that it's the original house on the That that would be a Dutch house at that point, not an Anglo Dutch. Thanks. Liz and I, we, we didn't do urban ex exploration. We actually had permission to go into a house <laughs> in a Skodak landing that was 18th century Dutch. The one that was just for sale? Yes. Yes, I was in that. Or you, so we saw that uh, the chimney on the stool that you were talking about. I'd never seen that before. How oh common yeah, is that? that's super common. Is it? Once you once you get into cast iron stoves, okay. it's super common just to put a stool or a platform and then frame the chimney up because it doesn't need to go all the way to the ground. And what did you think of that house? Oh, uh, that house was an interesting house. It had been modified probably in the federal period. It was originally a three-story traditional Dutch house. Uh, but they, they raised the floor um, and did horrible things to the timbers. 
Um, looks like some of it was sandblasted at some point. Uh, what were the I those love that house. phony baloney timbers in the top bedrooms? What was that about? Some of those were actually tidy, or what we call collar ties, uh, these guys, that had been removed when they raised the floor and pushed them further up. They were original timbers. They were? Yeah, they weren't phony baloney. They were original timbers, but they just got moved up. They looked like they were glued into the plaster. Well, what, what happened was the, they raised it up and then someone put drywall on it and, and bad things happened and nobody was spared. And, and, and they had, they had uh, shots out of them. Uh, it, yeah, well, those were, that's where it had been turned the other way. Oh, okay. So, no, things like that often. We thought they were just put there for effect. We, we, no, it is not in fact trimmer framing, which is the word for that sort of thing. Oh. Okay. Um, those were actually original tie, collar ties that had been moved up and sort of hacked out and bad things happened. Yeah, that's why I'm funny. I liked your explanation of bed coming from a Dutch word meaning assembly. Mm -hmm. Could you say more about the, how you count the vents, where they're located? So, uh, in a in a traditional vent, uh, a vent or an assembly, Dutch word vent, two boosts, no, two posts, and a tidy. So if you've got if you've got if you've got post post. Something transversing the frame, tying the two posts together, that's your assembly. Uh, on an English frame, you've got corner post, corner post, tie beam, tying things together. Um, now, to get deeper into the intricacies of timber framing, uh, English framing, they would build that wall and then build that wall and stand them up and drop tie beams on. Whereas uh, the Dutch are building assemblies and standing each assembly up. So uh, most American houses, actually barns and whatnot, are built sort of Dutch fashion. So that's a seven vent. That's a seven vent. Yep, that's a seven vent. Uh, if you break in analogy, it's vents and bays. So it would be seven vent, six bay. Uh, whereas this is a four vent, three bay. Um, this is a three bend two bay. So bays being the zones in between vents. Right. Answer the question? Yes. All right. What about um, chimney placement and fireplace placement? It seems clear in the English style the chimneys in the center. Um, in the Anglo Dutch style, where they put the chimney? And when you look at a house from the outside and you're trying to figure out if it's original Dutch or Anglo-Dutch and the chimney may or may not, like what clues do you have from the outside to see where the chimney was? So the, with an Anglo-Dutch, it, it gets weird because they, they're they really post-colonial. So you get those chimneys on stools, they sort of put them catch as catch can because cast iron stoves are a thing. Um, cast iron stoves come in the mid 19th century? Or? No, Benjamin Franklin, and if they okay. start coming in, Actually, if you have you predating what we consider like the Franklin stove, you had uh, German five plate stoves. So if you go down to say Huguenot Street, there are five plate stoves wherein you would have say in a in a in a, in a house that was two rooms deep. So you have a back tile and a front tile. If you had a big fireplace in the back, there'd be a hole in the wall with a cast iron box pushed up against the hole and plastered in. And you know, as you had your fire going in your cooking stove, your cooking fireplace, you just shove coals through into the cast iron box, which would then kick off heat with no smoke. So cast iron stoves, really, they're they're around in the 16th century, in the 17th century. They become what we think of as cast iron stoves. Benjamin Franklin holds a couple patents for them. Um, they really come about um, 1800. So once we're selling as a country, uh, you know, fireplaces, I mean, they're still being built, but it, you can heat very efficiently with tiny little stoves and rooms. Um, so chimney placement on a Dutch house, typically gable-ended. So on the gable ends, because true Dutch houses would have what are called um, jamless fireplaces, which are basically a modified medieval smoke hood. Um, where you sort of have two stringers between the tie beams and this big masonry stack running up. 
Um, there are some that uh, are on the eaves wall. So if you go to 48 Hudson, it had three jamless fireplaces. It had one on the back gable, and then it had uh, a jamless here on the side, which went up and protruded. And it really, it, if you think about it, it's got to get up beyond the peak of the roof in an urban setting. Um, and at 48 Hudson, there's another jamless, there's another firebox downstairs. So that's one of the ones where it's in the east wall. But we know from drawings of the time, Albany was, was right with these sort of gable-ended Dutch houses that had side eave jamless fireplaces. So um, in a Dutch house, really, it's in an urban setting, it's either going to be gable or side eaved. Uh, if you look here in the Hudson Valley, um, once you get out of the cities, it's pretty usually gable ending, unless there's an extension. So like, if you look at Lake of Island, you can see where it was added onto. Mm -hmm. um, so you got your two gable end chimneys, and they add another room, or they, you know, there's, there's the original room, and they add another, and so there's a gable end on the other side. Sometimes there's an intermediate It one. seems more obvious in brick houses or stone houses. It's way more obvious in brick or stone houses. Um, a lot of the wooden houses have the chimneys taken out. Yeah. There's one over in Churchtown that's probably, if it's not late 17th, it's very early 18th century, and the jamless was removed. Um, so there's no, there's no evidence of the chimney anymore. The framing is still there. And the, the, the molding uh, paint, so the paint, the ghosts of the original jamless molding is still there, but the chimney itself is gone. So it, it's, English, the English are pretty standard. It's in the center. You know, they, they like that hall and, powder, hall and parlor setup where you know, you've got a kitchen in one room and then eventually the kitchen goes back into the salt box. But the, the Dutch and the Anglo-Dutch are sort of catch the catch can. I know that's not really answering your question, but it's... Uh, no, it does. It's interesting to um, think how early wood stoves came in. I didn't realize they came in that early. You yeah. also see a lot of these houses in some of your slides, like a much later brick chimney that's just slapped on the outside and oh, yeah. put in an oil furnace or whatever. Yeah, that's usually, yeah, that's, they, they, they love doing that. Um, sometimes, if you're lucky, like I am, you put a cinder block chimney on there for the furnace. <laughs> <laughs> were those cinder chimneys stone or brick? Brick. Typically brick with a stone foundation. Um, if you and New England styles are typically brick with a stone foundation. If you if you have the time, it's worth the drive to go out to Minuteman Park in Lexington, Mass, and walk the trail. And about two miles, a mile and a half from the visitor center, there's the foundation of an 18th century house that they've they've built a steel frame up on, but the original chimney is still there, and you can see. You can see the hall and parlor uh, fireboxes, you can see the kitchen box, and then you can see the three bedroom fireboxes up on the second floor. And it's all perfectly laid out. It's perfectly visible. And that chimney is what? Brick or stone? Brick. Brick. And another question, the house that on 23 when you were in it, could you determine when maybe that was occupied last? Um, it looked like it had been occupied as late as the 80s, actually. Into the 90s. Into the 90s? Yeah, that was really late. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it, when I was there, um, I, it looked like there had been some um, squatters living there. Yeah. It's a nice house. I, I hope someone can get a hold of it and save it. I don't know what's going on with it. Um, was there a functional purpose to the mullet roof line? So, the side aisle, um, or the back room of a salt box. Um, on an English house, specifically an English two-story house, what it allows you to do is, is create a back room, which would typically have, uh, on an English house, a big kitchen with a buttery and a pantry. So somewhere to store your butter and bread. Um, and they just sort of be, that just sort of becomes the common thing. And the storage in that weird 
roof space above the kitchen becomes storage. Okay. Uh, it's not it's not a super uh, useful space. Um, and then on, on, on these little Anglo Dutch houses, it's sort of the same thing. You get that weird storage space off in the wing. Um, but it does it does give you pretty pretty quickly for low timber, you know, an entire extra room. You think about it in terms of you have to pay a carpenter in barrels of rum. Um, <laughs> You know, it's the, the less time they're on site, the less money slash wrong slash whatever you're paying them if you have to pay them. So uh, by just adding this back room, you don't, you know, sometimes you add half, get as much space for relatively low cost. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, just uh, this term school to, uh, I've always come from the from the you know, or Shelton News or yep, same thing. Or Scotch News. Yep. It's, it's, they're all the same. They're all the same thing. Yeah. That probably has a something to do with my um, propensity for Dutch things. I suppose. No. Yeah. School. But uh, it's. it's you know, I'm, I'm used to seeing them on these sort of weird little school things of the attic. Uh, but the one in Skodak Landing was on a shelf. And I, I do know the reason they were called Scotch chimneys, or because the Scots were notoriously parsimonious and didn't actually want to pay for a whole chimney. I wasn't sure if that was really uh, for that reason or if it was scotched, maybe in other words, held in by a board or something. I mean, it, 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 it could be both, uh, having the last name of Stuart. Uh, now that I think of that, a friend of mine has a house, I think it was 1600, so it has. Does have a, uh, a what I guess you would call a stool to me. It's a riser, you know, maybe goes up this high, and then the brickwork. Yeah. Yeah, it commences. No, it's 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 sort of interesting the ways they get around not actually paying for full masonry. And that knee, uh, knee and the riser there is yeah, it's huge timbers. Yeah. yeah. It's about, about two to three feet. I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's 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 the 17th, 18th century carpentry fashion to be like, oh my God, look at the size of the trees. We can we can build things with giant timbers. Um, yeah. I mean, it, ridiculous. I've I've spent time tramping around the Netherlands, and like I said, I've never seen. I mean, you go to something like the, the barn at the Navy Farm. Those timbers are one foot by two foot, um, beautifully hewn, plain, smooth. Uh, I've never seen a timber that big in the Netherlands except on churches and um, city halls. This is decade ago. I, I helped put uh, together a barn in the cat school. They took it down and put it put it up in another place. Mm -hmm. by one. Those upright tombs are like that. Uh, and, and, and square. Also, uh, so a lot of farmers in a contract with carpenter. The, the, the farmer had to do the roughing out. So the farmer would would cut down the tree and rough hew it to the demand, to whatever dimension was. And I can tell you, having spent days of my life, weeks, months, hewing timbers, um, it takes a lot of energy to convert a big tree into a small timber. <laughs> so if you can just get away, with, just get it square, that's great. Um, yes, they're heavy. Uh, but um, it, it's, it, it's efficiency. And so I think a lot of them, especially in some of those Catskill bank barns, you know, some of those corner posts are you know, 18 inches by 18 inches by 36 feet tall. Oh my God, but it's, it's, you're not gonna, you know, the farmer doesn't want to pay the carpenter more than they have to. So they're just gonna sort of rough it in and eh, it's okay, it's big timber. I would say that the, the problem with that is that they, the foundations were not well made. It, that, yeah, that is, that is the, 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 depending on where you are. They fell out and, you know, it's also a lot of the foundations were not, um, were not, I mean, they weren't, they were dry, they were dry there. That's right. So, um, or had a blind clay mortar. I know nothing about carpentry or building, but as fast as they built those houses, would they use green wood? Absolutely. Timber framing is designed specifically for green wood. 
Because because you don't have time. You don't have time. To, you don't have. You don't have time to dry it. And when I design a timber frame, the joinery is designed specifically to allow the frame to dry over time. Um, you wouldn't plaster it instantly. You let it. You let it settle for a while. But the the frame itself is cut green. The joinery is designed. We actually offset our pins so that as the whole thing dries, it pulls itself together and tightens itself up. Um, really, the the idea of dry timber carpentry that's 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 an industrial process where you've got the, the space and the time to kill and dry timbers and even big timbers. I mean, I get I get occasional client requests and say, oh, I want this all built out of you know eight inch by eight inch kiln dry whatever. There's no such thing as timber that big, that's fully kiln dry. Um, so it's designed for working green. My tools actually like working green wood. They don't like working dry wood because with the moisture still in the fiber, it, the wood works easier. So yeah, it's designed to be cut green, it's designed to be built green. Um, so it's, that's why when you, when you do a dendro chronological study of a house, you can pretty much say, well, the tree was harvested in fall of 1810. Chances are pretty good it was built in the fall of 1810 because you're not going to let that wood sit around. Because um, then, the longer you let it sit around, the more it has a chance to do all the twisting that you're talking about, the checking, the twisting. And unless you've got it locked into a frame, that timber is going to turn into a pretzel. Um, so you get it locked into a frame, and the, the frame itself resists the turning. So. This may, maybe I'm related, but the uh, toll house over at the Catskill uh, Bridge, does that represent anything Dutch? So the toll house, in fact, uh, yes, yes, that would in fact be, um, be a replica of a Dutch house. You can tell because uh, it has that sort of triangular brickwork up on the, the parapeted gable. The Dutch word for that is Fechtigen, um, sometimes also referred to as Maustu. Uh, Maustan, I, I, I call it Fechtigen because that's what the Dutch call it. Um, but uh, that allows you to create the, that flat parapeted gable without actually having to cut bricks to make it. Um, but yeah, no, that's, a, that's designed to look like a, a Dutch house, which would have been Common in Albany, uh, Kingston. Uh, most, of the, most of the cities around here in the 1660 to 1700 uh, would have looked right with those buildings. So. Um, with these houses, many, many of them, many of them uh, built with the cellars dug under them? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so my house, which is, you, you don't see, but there's an entire story underneath it that's actually open because it's built into the hillside but you do also have them with, with cellars and sometimes the cellar is just under sort of one bay mm -hmm. um, so you'll have you'll have a cellar under one bay and sort of a crawl space under the other bay um, if you were in the house in Skodak Landing you saw that where the those two front rooms under the original Dutch section yeah. had a full cellar and then or sort of it was a full floor and then you had that that uh, crawl space that was put under the 1820s edition. So. With, these, with the Anglo-Dutch houses, were they still at the beginning putting uh, the, uh, the cooking hearts in the basement? In the um, I haven't seen evidence of that, but I'm still looking. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of I'm I'm working on a paper right now where we're looking at. 17th and 18th century Dutch houses and the putting of the kitchen down in the basement mm -hmm. as a function of owning enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. Oh, because you have somebody that carries enslaved Africans. Enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. Jane. Um, I'm from North East, Southwestern Vermont, and I am keeping track of the kitchens in the basement that are cooking kitchens and are the primary kitchen for the house. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is probably that they were, first of all, they, a lot of them are kind of are Anglo-Dutch in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that allows the upstairs to be cleaner. Formal space. Okay. And also, when men can come in off the field, 
fields into the basement, into the kitchen, in the, in the season without having to get clean, and the house would be warmer, the basement would be warmer in the winter. And that's my understanding. But I've got a list in our area of 16 houses that definitely have a cooking, living kitchen in the basement. Now, we know that in 17890, there were 30 people of color in Bennington County. Some of them were definitely slaves, but there were 3,000 people. So it's not necessarily a space for slaves. Yeah, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the, the, the upper room in more traditional Dutch houses where you've got what we call an opcomer, mm -hmm. so they split it. Um, and around about 17, 2017, 30, you start to see this effusion of what we call an outcomer, where they add on a house and then sort of, you get this sort of split level ranch thing going on, where there's a full basement with a kitchen and then a, a finished bedroom above, um, where you could have people coming in. But they don't, those, uh, typically in those the Dutch houses that I've looked at, except for one over in Stuyvesant, they didn't have entrances to the exterior, to the basement. It's all coming in from the inside of the house. Mm -hmm. So um, it would not surprise me if in Vermont that was the way of it. Well, New York State and a little bit in in, in uh, uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, that whole, that whole area. Yeah. yeah, you've got fascinating angle of Dutch houses, yeah. by you. Yeah. The Skodak House, um, it's built on brick piers at the, at the bottom. The Where porch. In, I'm sorry? The porch is on brick piers. Yeah, the porch. The porch is on brick piers. The so house was that itself. a later addition? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But then the entrance to the lower kitchen is is through there. Yes. Yeah. So I mean that that house has been muddled with. Okay. That that house does not in any way, shape, or form look like it did when it was first built in 1740. Right. Um, like any good house in the Hudson Valley or anywhere, it's been things have happened. Yeah. Um, Stuart Brand's book, How Buildings Learn. I mean, it's, that's what happens. The buildings just change over time. So that they wanted to go away from the Dutch house that looked probably like the Peter Winnie house with steep gables. So they raise the floor, they add a porch on, they give it a freeze board, they, so the, they put that, the big federal windows in. That fireplace in the basement, do you think that was the original cooking fireplace? That's how they used it? Or? Um, there's evidence in that house of Janus fireplaces. There is. Oh yeah, both ends, both gable ends. They're trimmers for, for Janus fireplaces. Really? Yep. And if you went up into the second story bedroom and looked at the floorboards, there was a large patch. Yes. That patch is where the Jamus fireplace went through. Oh, okay. Could you say more about uh, cellars that are built into the sides of hills? So, um, when, in the I've, heard, I've heard there's some disagreement among architectural historians about what tradition in Europe that represents. German or not? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to track down. Um, everyone likes to have definitives, right? Um, you know, I, I talk about Netherlandish architecture, and I use Netherlandish because it's a little bit more loosey-goosey than Dutch. Um, but yet I call it an Anglo-Dutch house, so even I. Uh, and I was talking to a fellow timber framer today, and uh, yesterday, and we were talking about those big anchor beams, and he says, I think they're Danish. Because he just came back from Denmark and found out buildings were so on them. And he said, well, there's that whole Danish Empire thing. And I'm like, you mean the Viking Empire that happened in the ninth century? Like, I, don't, I don't know of a Danish Empire. Um, so buildings built in the hillside, that's clearly not a Dutch thing. Right. Because the Dutch don't use cellars. Because unless you're in like Brenta or Kronien on the eastern side of the country, maybe Limburg, uh, Robin, the crowns, you're underwater. You don't. You can't put. You can't put a cellar in because you've made the land with boulders. So that's not a thing. But we know the Palatine Germans used them. So maybe it came over the Palatines, but it could have also come from Walloons. It could have come from. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many traditions. Uh, just like people will tell you that log cabins came from Scandinavia. Um, I have a friend who's writing a book on log houses, and he has cataloged log houses, I think, at this point in 
67 different countries. Um, and they all, all those traditions end up coming here. You see the differences in the joinery. That's how you start to tell the difference in the houses. You've had your hand for a while. I just wanted to add something about it. Like the, the, the cellars, in the I come from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm more specialist in farmhouses, but uh, there, will, there will be plenty of cellars in these houses, in farmhouses, but small ones, not enough for cooking. I've never seen a, a cellar or a basement with a, a fire, fire place, yeah. and there's fire in it. That's typically from, like, over here. But I've never seen one in, in, in the Netherlands. Yeah, I've never seen one. So, but there is for storage, for, for storage of goods, of preservation of goods. Mm -hmm. So, that's, that's quite interesting. But that's more on the eastern. It's more on the eastern side, isn't it? I mean, I haven't seen much in like the Skyrim places like that. I haven't seen many zero, many zeros. No, not at all. Yeah, just small ones. Yeah. Like before if we're making cheese, sometimes yeah. storage of, of cheese, if we're like a, a dairy, a dairy belt area. Let's not let's not forget just, the, just the, the cheese mines of Hurley. Also, it's just a small part of the of the building, the basement, the oldest one, but still, it's a small. Uh, Do you know anything about the town, the uh, village of Livingston, originally the town of Johnston, which was kind of, I guess, a, a planned community where lots were divided up, and if you built a home on it, it was, uh, serfs were able to own their own homes. Hmm. All that did you use, did did you use the word serf? Yes, serfs on the Livingston. Yes, because that is, because that is the Livingston. Actually, I, I know almost nothing about the Livingston side of Columbia County. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> I used to put the church there and I used to drive through Livingston every day. Um, but I just, the, I've been so focused on the Dutch end of the county. Um, yeah, because the, um, uh, I was told anyway that the history was that uh, you, if you got one house up in, you know, or one room up by a certain amount of time, you would be able to claim that property. Uh, so my, question really revolved whether some of the houses there were originally, you know, one small house and then the center was built on later? Oh, I'm, sure. I'm, 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 I'm sure. I mean, the, the thing is, we like to look at these houses and, and think, you know, well, this is, this is, this is it, this is a beautiful colonial yeah. house. Um, when you think about the time and energy in both gathering of materials, finding a carpenter, who has time in their schedule, maybe you're lucky it's enough. Still a problem. Well, it's still a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem then, it's a problem now. Um, you know, we know that in places like New Paltz, most beautiful stone houses, uh, New Paltz was settled in 1678, the earliest dendro we've gotten on any of the houses on Huguenot Street, 1698. So, what are they living in for 20 years? Well, we know what they're living in. We've, done, we've found the archaeology. There are a couple houses where it's just post and ground, sort of post and tear, sort of all the, some of the houses down in Louisiana or the Chesapeake Bay house, and they're pit houses. We know, we found one of the pit houses, complete with a Delft tile backed fireplace, six feet in the ground. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it almost looks like they're, they're sort of, the, they're these interesting temporary shelters that get knocked together. Um, a couple of the open look to examine arm, where it's sort of these ice iron shelters sort of half dug into the ground. And that's what they're living in for 20 years is they're getting the, the stones together to build those big houses. Um, actually, the one in the one we know in Huguenot Street, the pit house was below ground and the barn that was connected to it was above ground. So it was a connection uh, 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 farm and, and house, which is fairly, very common in the Netherlands is common in the 17th century here, but quickly falls out of fashion. Mm. So. Okay. Yeah, so just going back to the basements with um, the kitchens in them, mm -hmm. the cellars, um, I remember I did a tour uh, through the Van Allen house, mm -hmm. and they, have, they had that, but at the point that there was emancipation of enslaved persons, uh, the guide said something about 
a lot of those chimneys were taken off because it became quickly a matter of shame that they had owned slaves? That would not surprise me. Okay. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm about a month into my research about the op commerce and lower kitchens being uh, attached with the enslaved Africans in the 18th century Madison Valley. But uh, it would not surprise me that those chimneys later got taken off. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, I used to work at Historic Hudson Valley down in uh, Terrytown, and we had a couple of African American interpreters, and, and they really focused on the enslaved African angle there. And inevitably, once a day, I'd hear somebody go, "Wait, there were no slaves in New York State." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and we've just we've collectively, as Northerners, sort of forgotten that. Uh, yeah, and up until emancipation and manumission, it was. Uh, it was just as much of a thing up here as it was. Now, there were some places Massachusetts was never really keen on it, uh, but New York certainly was, and that certainly was for Massachusetts enslaved Indians. Yes. <laughs> yes. Native Americans. Yes. Yeah. The other part of my family. <laughs> <laughs> um. Just again, still thinking about these uh, kitchens in the basement. If they didn't use them in Holland, they seem to have quickly settled on that idea here because there are Dutch houses with basement kitchens from Manhattan oh, yeah. all the way up. So it was something that was done because the terrain allowed it. Well, it's also, if you've been in a room with a jamless fireplace working, it is one of the most inefficient heat oh. sources out there. Uh, it's smoky, yes. but the room above it is going to have a giant masonry stack that's going to get heated all day. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, like, if you, if you can put that one floor down and get the heating without having to deal with the smoke, so I think, um, I think that plays into it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, again, it's, it's, you, you're trying, if you're trying to find absolutes and, re, and it's, it's all over the place. One of the things I've started doing is sort of looking at houses as material culture and letting the building tell me how it was used. Because every building's slightly different. There are there are very there are very few sort of this is it, this is the definitive thing. So just like today. Two people may own the exact same house. They may buy the exact same house from the exact same builder, framework wise, and they look completely different. So Levittown. Yeah, Levittown. <laughs> that place is now eligible for the National Register. <laughs> so, um, looking at these diagrams and these kind of more modest, like two bay Anglo Dutch houses, can you describe like what you talked a bit about the building boom that happened in Columbia County in the um, early 19th century? Mm -hmm. What socio economic head of household was building this housing type. Is this like, um, I mean, they're wealthy enough to commission a home, so they're like upper middle class. And there are also a lot of homes that we see from this time period that are brick, larger. I mean, that would be. I mean, brick, brick, is, the, more brick is the highest form. I mean, brick is the, high, is the most expensive thing you can build with. Yeah. Um, you go places and you'll see, you know, brick facade, stone on the other three walls, but the facade that faces the road is brick. You want to use the expensive stuff on the front. Uh, Van Allen House, it's covered in brick, but it's a timber frame. Really? Yep. That is a skin. <laughs> uh, the Peter Winnie House, skinned in brick. That is absolutely, a, it's a symbol of wealth. Uh, and you'll look for the little wall irons. They're, they're we uh, got mirror anchors, the wall anchors that are in the houses, which tie the exterior skin to the timber frame. Because without that, the brick would fall off. Because it's one brick deep. Uh, the Van Allen house, one brick deep. Looks, looks really good. It's just a skin. But it makes it look like an expensive house. Yeah. Like his son Allen was able to convince his neighbors that he had a lot of money. Because he had brick brought down from Albany to cover his timber frame. Um, Stone takes a lot of time to collect stone, but it's free. 
it's just lying in the field. You just got to pay someone or do it yourself. It'd take 20 years to plow your fields enough so you get enough food, enough stone to build a house. Um, some of these houses are built on speculation. I think the houses in Valencia were probably built, paid for by mill owners because they're all fairly standardized. They're these Anglo-Dutch houses, two-family Anglo-Dutch houses, which were probably actually, you know, multi-family, not just two-family. Um, and they all look like sort of built within the same 10-year period, probably by the same sort of family of carpenters paid for by the different mill owners. Um, the people who are building Alpha County, a lot of them listed as farmer. So, I mean, these are not, if you think about it, the farmers are doing the conversion of the timbers, the, the, the basic conversion of the timbers. You're bringing a carpentry crew on for two, three weeks to do all the joinery and raise the frame. Maybe you're paying for them to put in windows and do it. Maybe you're doing it yourself. Um, so, you know, it's, I, would, I wouldn't even say that these are upper middle class. These are, these are, these are fairly, I don't think you can be poor and own one of these, but a farmer who's making their way or a tradesperson. Now, a lot of the, the massive influx of 10,000 people, they're all coming from New England. And a lot of them are coming from Providence and Nantucket and New Bedford um, and they're whalers. So they're coming with that money. Now they may not, you know, they may only have a 272 lay of the of the of the barrel price, but they're still coming in with enough money to pay for a carpenter to build a house. So I would say they're probably solidly lower middle class, you know, just enough to, to pay somebody. But this is also the biggest investment you're ever gonna make in the 18th and 19th century. There is no bigger investment than a house. Not like not like today. In those days, there was what, now what we would call today a middle class. They were the merchants, the upper class, and poor people. But middle class as we know it, like us, I guess, <laughs> really did not come into being until, you know, I mean, yeah, so my generation. Logistically, the middle class is, an, is a creation of an industrialized society right. where you can have enough money to have leisure time. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so we're talking trade merchant class. Right. right. You know, that's that which we could then equate to middle class. That's the easiest, uh, the easiest parallel. Yeah. If you were wealthy, you did not want your daughter to marry a tradesperson. No, no, and that attitude continues to this day. <laughs> middle class people don't want their daughters to marry tradespeople. I don't understand because I can tell you I'm a tradesman and I need to find a living. So, um, and people always need their houses to be worked on. So, always need an electrician. People always want their, their lights to turn on and their toilets to flush. So, um, any other questions? Would you find any uh, low additions like the Dutch frame houses in the late 1600s, early 1700s? Like, uh, like a salt box? Yeah, so, the, so we have a few with side aisles, um, primarily down on the island, and sort, of, and sort of the lower end of, of the island. Um, so, not in this region. Not in this region so much. Because that's uh, a topology, that's also a that topology. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That you can find in the southwestern part, southwestern part of the Netherlands. Yeah. You got these separate, separate uh, houses. like. In Holland, uh, more, mostly it's a combination of uh, the, the, the farmhouse and the, the barn is connected. Yeah, the border right? Except for the southwestern part, mm -hmm. like in Flanders. Yeah, it's, and so, and so conversely, Long Island, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. and they're settled by, Flan, by Flemish and Walloon. It makes sense. Yeah, that's where then, and you get the, the swept E that everyone likes yeah. to talk about, the Dutch swept E. We call that the, we call it Flemish kick or a It's a it's that's from that that southwestern section. So I think what you're seeing down there with the side aisles and, and that's 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 Flemish or Walloon. That's what it's called the Netherlands language. But uh, I think it's quite interesting because also in the southwestern part of the Netherlands you will find like in the 18th century, 17th or 18th century, you find this uh, trend of like. Uh, I mean, this addition connected to like the, the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in the, to me it's interesting, is it just like, what, what kind of influence is it, or is it just pragmatically, like yeah. the farmers? The and, then, and as architects and historians, this is sort of the fun thing we do, right, is, is you know, we talk about the Dutch gamble in the United States. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not really a thing in the Netherlands. <laughs> Uh, the Dutch gamble start appearing in the Netherlands in the 1760s. We're pretty sure they came from the United States and went back to the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> you won't, you won't find any in the Holland. No, no, no. It's it's and so the so when you say Dutch colonial, you know Dutch colonial revival, it's this sort of blocky, gambly thing that has very little to do with Dutch colonial anything, um, or the Swedish gamble. Stairways, staircases, staircases. Tell us about that, because we, don't, we haven't seen them yet. So, uh, location, construction. In an English house, the staircase would be right here, yeah. in front of the chimney bay. <coughs> You'd walk in, and it would be this tight little staircase, winder staircase. Um, and typical Dutch frames and Atlantis frames, yeah. uh, you find them run between the vents. They're usually fairly steep. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just the way it's framed. You can't, you can't put it. It's got to run back toward the eave. Right. Um, same thing with the Anglo Dutch houses. Uh, I tell you, in my house, the the stairs to the uh, upper story runs right here, and it's it's a terrifyingly steep <laughs> staircase. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend ever doing that. A glass or two of scotch. Um, this the staircase here was later was was changed and now it's 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 parallel to the eave. So they cut timbers out to do that. So in a, in this house you're talking usually and they're usually boxed in. How, how large is the box? What's the horizontal dimension? Uh, I've seen anywhere from well, so the sort of the stairs is less than four foot wide because it's four foot on center, um, and then I've seen them as sort of. Uh, sort of short as six feet to think about a stair. So dark. Uh, not even, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, 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 they're fairly tight, vertical. Um, you know, the idea of these great palatial stairs, that's a, that's a federal thing. How often are they by the fireplace, by the chimney? Um, in an English house, they're always by the chimney. Okay. They're always in the chimney bank. In a Dutch house, Usually the chimneys uh, were on the gables. If they were, if they were in the eaves, uh, usually in cities they were in the eaves up front, and the staircases were sort of in the back. Um, sometimes they're in the middle of the frame. It's, it's, they really tend to wander around the Netherlands houses. They're not as codified as, as English houses. Um, so where does the term center hall colonial fit in with either Anglo or Anglo? So, um, in the federal period, using this footprint, but give it two stories, if you take the chimney out and put the chimneys on the gable and into the halls and parlors, you open up that center bay. Um, you, see that, uh, you see that more in the south. So New England houses, they always put the chimney inside. You start getting to the southern colonies where you don't need that heat mass at birth. Um, then you see the chimneys on the outsides. Um, and that's really what starts to create that grand central passage, stairs. Um, you do get that in Netherlandish houses, like if you go down to Van Cortland Manor, that it has a big central passage in the middle, which with Dutch doors, you open up the upper doors and you allow for a nice breeze. Um, but yeah, uh, Center Hall Colonial, that's a that's a, a later thing, and it's a very wealthy thing. Because you can afford to toss your heat source out of the central master building. The old Billis house on Staten Island, have you been there? I have. The roof of the, the back, the add-on, it, it's curved, and they call it a cat scratch roof. That's what they used to call it. Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's, they, it's, it's, they have great terms for all these things. Uh, broke back, cat scratch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's called cat scratch because cats would scratch trying to get out of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a, that actually, that house has more uh, Flemish Walloon. It's that swept eve thing that's going on. Um, so.
Yeah, it's because that's also to make a curved roof line. That's fairly specific carpentry. Yeah, that's excessive carpentry. That's yeah. not. That's not just get the rafters, stand them up, put some tie beams in, and go. So. That's a fancy house. That is. Yeah, that's a fancy house. The more curved it was, the fancier it was. The straighter the lines, the easier it was built. Those house that uh, house that you showed in Hampton, was that the Balford Farm in East Hampton? It's right on the green. Right next to home sweet home, near home sweet home. Yeah. Yeah, it's right across from the cemetery. I recognize it from and things like that. I, 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 that. I took a picture of that when I was cutting a timber frame in Sac Harbor. So, um, yeah, I hadn't written down the notes. I just took a picture of it because I thought it was a few little half game. So, yeah. I'll have to write down what, what that building is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we're running. I think we're I think we're good. Yes. Thank you. Thank